Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. I think I'll get started with the next talk. Um, on the schedule was a talk by Yong Ri, um, but we're actually sort of swapping that out. And Cha happened to be giving this talk earlier, or was going to give this talk earlier today across campus, sort of internally. And I think Young wonderfully recognized that this is the perfect talk for this workshop. So Cha will be talking to us here and then broadcasted to the rest of Microsoft or anybody else who wants to watch um, live. So Cha Zhang is a researcher in Microsoft Research and did a, has been working jointly with some other folks on a fabulous automated lecture capture system in a room we have across campus. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here. Um, today, I'd like to talk about uh, the automated lecture capturing and broadcasting system in uh, MSR's one, uh, one of MSR's lecture room, 1159. Um, So um, why do we need to a automated lecture room? Of course, the main reason is cost. Um, for a, to operate a um, lecture room capturing and recording system, uh, and broadcasting system, uh, there's actually two kind of major costs involved. First one is we call a fixed cost. Basically involves uh, all the stuff you need to set up the system, like you, you need to buy all the computer equipment, you need to set up all the cameras, all the microphones. And this cost is one-time cost. So um, when the time goes by, the hardware cost is going down. So the fixed cost really is not very expensive. And the second part is the reoccurring uh, staffing cost. So basically, before the lecture, somebody needs to go there and turn on all the, uh, all the uh, system. And then during the lecture, uh, if we want to give the speaker some freedom to walk around and maybe also capture the audience, uh, there's got to be someone there tracking the speaker, like what we have in the back right now. Um, and of course, there's also a need to switch between cameras if we really have multiple cameras. Now, after the lecture, uh, maybe because the speaker is willing to share the slides, so we can, uh, somebody need to help to merge the audio video stream with the slides and then post the talk online. And this can be really expensive because that a lot of human labor are involved. So uh, here's the outline of the talk. Uh, I will start by talking about some of the design goals uh, of the system and then mention the system architecture. Uh, and then I will talk about the uh, lecture capturing part, basically does this automated uh, capturing of the speech speaker and audience. And then I provide some uh, system uh, usage statistics and then finally it's a uh, conclusion of future work. So while we were designing the system, we were actually thinking about a lot of things. We want to be in the shoe of uh, who's using the, uh, the system. So first thing we saw is, well, what a user really want. Uh, by user, I mean somebody who's sitting uh, on a remote desktop and trying to see what's going on in the lecture room. Uh, it could be a live viewing of the lecture. It could be a on-demand viewing of the lecture. Um, of course, the first thing the user wants is that a high-quality, synchronized audio, video, and slide stream so he can really get all the content of the lecture. And uh, uh, during the live broadcasting, because everything is live, it's very fast, so uh, we don't want to have any sacrifice in terms of the audio-video quality. Um, during the on-demand uh, uh, viewing of the lecture. First thing is we want the lecture to be immediately available online. So just after I finish my talk, people can already watch the line, uh, talk online um, immediately. And then there's also a easy browsing factor. Um, basically is that the, the user may not have the patient to start from the very beginning and, and the uh, very end. So he will just jump around the slide and only look at the portion that he or she is really interested. So. Uh, easy browsing is another uh, major thing that we want to have. And also, uh, well, the last thing is pretty similar. You want the, the 
uh, viewer to view the lecture at his or her own pace. So let me give you a quick uh, demo of what our system looks like. Hopefully the network works. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the website of uh, our lecture live and on-demand broadcasting system. So you can see that uh, here are the lectures that's being uh, either recorded or currently live online. So you can see there's a, a talk happening this morning. Uh, you can go there and look at the abstract of the talk, uh, biography of the speaker, and some detail where the lecture is happening. And there's also, uh, here's the talk I'm giving right now. It's actually live broadcasting. Uh, you can see uh, if you click into the talk, and hopefully this get connected. Um, on the right hand, on the, on the right hand side, of, uh, you can see the slides I'm showing. Uh, on the left hand side, it's still connecting, but it's supposed to be a live video that's showing uh, what I'm Talking. <laughs> well, yes. Okay. So there might be a little bit of delay, like a few ten seconds or so delay, but uh, uh, it's basically live. Um, so during live, you can also you can see the slide, hide the slides, show the slides, still go to the abstract uh, and all that. But you have less uh, flexibility because you cannot say jump forward because the, the talk is not there yet. So uh, this flexibility is given to the on-demand on viewers. So let's go back to look at one of the lecture that's happened this morning. You can see the talk is available. And I, when I click the lecture, uh, is it going? It's connecting. Okay, so maybe I will just show some slides. Let me turn off this. So this is what you see as on demand. And you can see that uh, here, because of the, uh, AV stream is already there, so you can pause. You can uh, click forward by clicking somewhere uh, on the timeline. And also, here's a feature that uh, on the right-hand side, you can actually show all the slides that's being captured. And you can go next or previous during your uh, playback. And if you uh, go a bit too far, then you can either click a button saying synchronize the video with the slides, or uh, reverse, if you know, don't know where the slides now uh, in the video part, then you can synchronize the slides with the video. So these are all the nice features that you can provide during the uh, on-demand broadcasting. Okay, so uh, that's about the uh, user. Now what about the speaker? So this system is particularly designed for a corporate environment where we typically have external speakers. So um, normally, uh, when an external speaker comes to give a talk, it's, very, it's typically very hard to ask them to give us uh, their slides. So we don't want the need to have them send us either the slides before or afterwards. And also, um, the speaker don't get passion because if, if they are restricted, say, okay, we are recording the lecture and you have to stand there, no move, otherwise we'll lose you because it's... Uh, automated. So there's no restriction on his or her uh, behavior during the talk. And uh, as a system administrator, uh, this means the, the person who runs the system. And we want to start and stop the lecture recording uh, just by one click. So uh, say click one button, say start the lecture, and the lecture will be captured, and then it will be broadcasted online automatically. And then when the talk uh, ends, you will just click one button and everything is done and then the lecture will be online for online broadcasting. So that's the uh, uh, administrator part. 
uh, of course, during the capturing process, everything is automated, and there's no tedious like post-processing because uh, it's also quite expensive in terms of human labor. And the last part is as a human system designer, designer being me, who designed the system, and one of the major things that we were thinking of is that we want to make the system really portable. So uh, that means if you w want to install the system in another room, it won't take too much trouble. Uh, and I will mention that later, how we achieve this task. So here are a summary of the key solutions we have provided in our system. Uh, um, on the left-hand side is the goals, and you can see that if we want to provide synchronized audio-video slides, no pre-post-processing, and on-demand view at users' own pace, uh, we actually uh, specifically designed the system architecture so everything is possible. And then if we want high-quality audio capturing, uh, we develop techniques such as sound source localization, beam forming, and uh, digital audio mixing uh, to enhance the audio quality. And since we don't need any slides from the speaker, we actually capture slides live during the lecture using a high-resolution uh, slide capturing system. And because we don't have any restriction on the speaker's behavior, so we actually had developed an automated speaker tracking system. Um, and also, because we want to capture some of the audience who ask a question, so um, we have the sound source localization pointing to the audience so that if somebody asks a question, we'll immediately know where he is and point the audio, audience camera to that person. Um, the last thing is that we want it to be portable to various room conditions, so um, we actually have a bunch of things related. For example, we use the IP-based Pentio zoom camera instead of anal analog cameras, so the camera can be anywhere. Uh, on the campus, and there's also uh, speaker tracking, scripting, language, and all these things related. So if you look at all these solutions, the first part is mainly about automated broadcasting, so uh, how we can broadcast uh, the content out. And then the next four components are really about automated content capturing. So um, here are some of the related work we uh, that uh, already developed in the literature. Uh, most of the system that we describe here actually only focus part of this, uh, the things that we consider. For example, uh, the first few items actually focus on the automated content capturing. So uh, back in 1994, there's a system called Streams. Basically, they set up a few cameras in the lecture room and then stream all the videos to the client, the, the remote client. And the remote client basically select which, whichever one that he or she wants to look at. And uh, um, in 1998, there's an auto-auditorium system, which is currently being used uh, at IBM Research. Um, they actually develop a fully automated uh, content capturing system uh, and record everything onto a tape. Um, in uh, the Classroom 2000 project, um, they developed an electronic uh, whiteboard, so people can actually write ink, uh, digital ink, on the whiteboard, and everything gets recorded. Uh, also, uh, there's a Cornell Lecture Browser, and there the focus is how do you do post-processing automatically. Basically, uh, this is assuming in a university environment, so you assume you do have the slide. How do you automatically merge the slides and the audio-video signals so they get synchronized and can be just uploaded on online? And also, there's a ICAM system, which is developed here at MSR. That's a first-generation system. Uh, and I will briefly mention the system later. So um, there's many, many more. And on the automated live on-demand broadcasting part, uh, we have systems like BIBS at University of California at Berkeley. Uh, that is uh, a system being widely actually deployed uh, at Berkeley, capturing about 15 to 20 lectures per semester. Uh, the focus there was to make the uh, broadcasting really simple and automated. Um, although they don't have automated content capturing uh, mentioned. And there's also the ePresence system from University of Toronto. Um, there, um, they actually, the focus was actually to provide a very high quality um, experience of the remote client. So they actually support uh, communication between the remote client and the speaker. 
And for this purpose, they actually have to uh, have a moderator sitting there helping the speaker, the communication between the speaker and the um, uh, remote clients. And lastly, there is a appraisal classroom system from any stream. Uh, they don't really do live broadcasting, but they have some very nice features like integration with um, Outlook, so you can just schedule a talk and it will automatically start to capture and things like that. Okay, so uh, let me go on and talk about the uh, system architecture of, uh, of our uh, system, basically. Uh, on the left hand side you see is all the components that produce the content. And you can see there is a ICAM2 automated audio and video capturing device. Uh, there's a production console which basically controls everything and uh, also does some kind of, uh, also does some uh, slide change detection. And there's also a slide capture device which captures the, what's going on on the presenter's uh, laptop. On the right hand side, there's uh, four servers used in our system. One is a streaming server that streams all the audio co uh, video content. There is also a web server which provides the uh, web interface so that the remote client can click and go into the lecture. And there's also a database server which stores all the lecture information like who's giving the speaker, what is the abstract of the speaker, things like that. And there's also a storage server mainly used for on-demand viewing, so the video will be actually stored there. Um, so here's uh, how the slides are captured. Uh, basically, the product console is uh, in the role of controlling everything. So uh, it will monitor what's being seen at the slide capture device. And once it detects a slide change, it will tell the slide encoder, now encode this frame. And then the slide image encoded is sent to the storage server. And then meanwhile, the production console send this script to the database server. Script meaning at this time, this image has been captured uh, and stored somewhere here. And also, the production console is in controlling of all these administrator, uh, administrative info, information, like uh, all the abstract and, and those are inputted from the uh, production console. Uh, in terms of, this is part is the audio and video stream. So, also, same, same time, the production console is sending all the scripts to the audio video encoder. And the encoder we're using here is a Windows Media encoder. So it actually has the capability of uh, putting this script into the audio video stream. So, uh, and then all the data are just sent to the stream server. And during the broadcasting process, um, the audio, video, and the script are simultaneously copied to the storage server for later on-demand uh, showing. So, so you look at this, you can see, well, because the production console is really in control of everything, though that makes sure that the audio and video are really synchronized. And because we are copying the data simultaneously during the lecture, and also because uh, we're capturing the slides live, so there's really no pre and post production involved here. And also, um, in order to support the online viewing at user's own pace, you can notice that, first of all, the scripts are stored on the database. So when the user jump around the slides, they actually access the database and query where the images are stored. And also because uh, uh, because the audio and video is encoded there uh, with the AV encoder, so um, so the, the user can just jump around the audio video stream and look at where they, wherever they want. So here are a few snapshots of the uh, management console or the production console that I just mentioned. Uh, the, on the right side, the image shows uh, the system administrator just select a lecture for a certain day, a certain topic. And then when the speaker arrives in the lecture room, uh, the administrator will take a snapshot of that speaker and put it, uh, as you just saw uh, on the web page, there's a small picture showing who's the speaker. And then uh, the administrator will initialize the slide detection, and then after a few clicks, just the uh, star, 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 it will start the broadcasting and everything is going to be in progress. So 
that's really nice. Now, what happened during the broadcasting? So during live broadcasting, uh, here's what happened. We have a bunch of servers here, and we assume also we have some web client that's trying to access the content. So the audio and the video stream are streamed through the streaming server. Basically, that's uh, what we record it. And the slide images and the lecture information are sent to the web server, and then the web server serves the uh, web client. Uh, during on-demand broadcasting, there's a, some subtle difference here because we, we don't have this AV encoder anymore. So the audio-video stream is sent through the streaming server, and th the slides and lecture information are sent to the web server. There's a, a subtle difference here that the script now is sent from the database server. That's really important because that enables the user to jump around the slides because uh, all the user does is just query the database instead of looking into the audio video stream and decode everything in order to know where the uh, script is. Okay, so um, having talked about the system architecture, now I will start to talk about the automated uh, lecture capturing system. We actually have a first generation ICAM system built by Young. And then uh, this is a system we actually deployed last October. And we have a bunch of enhancement in terms of audio, in terms of how we capture the visual slides, and in terms of the video. So let me briefly mention what this first generation ICAM system is. So uh, it's actually pretty simple in this diagram. We have a lecture tracking camera. We have an audience tracking camera. And we may have a few other cameras, like an overview camera, some uh, slide tracking camera. And then every camera is an analog camera, so they connect to a computer. The computer digitizes the video. And then each computer, we think of them as a virtual cameraman. Okay? So these virtual cameramen, after they digitize the video, they send the video to a central computer, which we call the virtual director. The virtual director looks at the content of all these videos and then decide, okay, now the speaker is giving some really important thing, and I'm going to show the speaker. So the virtual director will control a analog mixer uh, and select one of the stream as the output. So that output is sent to a uh, Windows Media Encoder to, in to encode. Um, the system has been very successful. It was uh, deployed in June 2001 and has been used for uh, almost four years. And, uh, um, during which almost about 400 and uh, 400 plus lectures being captured and uh, broadcasted. Uh, a few problems with the uh, previous ICAM system is, first of all, uh, everything is analog because at that time the, the hardware is not advanced enough. So uh, we need a lot of computers. We need a, a, a very bunky analog mixer sitting there. And there's miles of wires connecting all these components, trying to uh, work together. And uh, the, this makes it really difficult to port the system to another room, because uh, we need to rewire everything and uh, set up, put it, set up everything there, which is very difficult. Another thing is that uh, the virtual director rules are all hard-coded into the code, so it's really hard to change. If you move to a room that's a different configuration, you're going to, uh, the system just not going to work. So uh, for all these reasons, we actually de we developed this ICAM2 system, which now uh, we choose to use a network-based Pentio Zoom camera. So in that case, all we need for each camera is really two uh, input. One is the power, one is the Ethernet. And then um, the the, the computer that's controlling all these cameras can be sitting anywhere in the campus and just connect to the cameras through Ethernet. Um, and the mixing and all that is done digitally on the computer instead of using the analog mixer. So that saves a lot of hardware. And this makes the system really uh, portable. So here's a very typical configuration of what a ICAM uh, 2 uh, system need. So s consider this a lecture room. Um, where we, you have a few rows of audience and there's a podium there. So we mount a speaker camera at the back of the room pointing to the speaker. And then we also put uh, a combo, a combo of a IP network camera 
and also a microphone array on the podium. So these point to the audience. So you, we can capture what the audience response is. So that's the basic configuration. It's um, pretty simple. And the camera at the back, the speaker camera, is responsible to capture images like the overview of the lecture room. Uh, it need to track the speaker. Um, you also need, to, from time to time, to capture the slide. Um, and for the audience camera, um, for example, if somebody asks a question, that camera should point to those people who's asking a question. And also, sometime it will show some audience overview of the uh, lecture room. And both the two components are connected through Ethernet to a, a computer, which serves as both a virtual cameraman and a virtual director. And then what's output is sent to the streaming server for broadcasting. So what's new in ICAM 2 comparing with uh, ICAM 1 uh, in terms of technology here? First of all, uh, in terms of audio, we have a much higher uh, quality audio uh, comparing with the first uh, uh, system. Um, the, we use sound source localization from a, an eight element microphone array, where in the ICAM system we use two element. Uh, we use a beamforming technology to capture what's uh, being asked from the audience. Uh, while in the previous system, we just use a regular microphone from the podium to capture that. And we have an intelligent digital audio mixing that try to mix the audio with higher quality. In terms of visual aids, in ICAM 1, we actually have a dedicated slide uh, camera. And in, now we use the automated a slide change detection and uh, a, um, a high resolution slide uh, capturing system to capture that. In terms of video, uh, we have a much portable design. We developed a hybrid speaker tracking algorithm, which I will detail, uh, talk about it in detail later. We also developed scripting language so that we can move the system from one room to another. And there's also a direct show implementation, so that makes the system uh, portable. So uh, let me go into them in a little bit more detail um, about the audio. So the first thing, the first technique related is uh, sound source localization. Basically, what a sound source localization does is trying to estimate where the sound source is coming from. And why do we need this? There's two reasons. First, we need to identify who is asking a question in the audience. And second, because we know who is asking the question, we can actually amplify his or her voice uh, and suppress all the other noises. And how we do this? Um, this is a work by um, Ray and Dene in 2004. It's a time uh, difference of arrival base. Basically, imagine you have a sound source, the red dot there. And when the sound source emits some sound wave, it will reach microphone and microphone one and microphone two at different time instances. So based on that, we can actually formulate the problem and uh, solve the problem and find out where the sound source is. Uh, the approach that in this particular paper um, is uh, a more generalized way of formalizing the problem, which considers both um, ambient noise in the room as well as room uh, reverberation in the room. So it's a more accurate solution. Uh, I'm not going to go into details, but the result is we can achieve up to, up to two degree accuracy in, term of, in a regular office environment. So after we uh, know where the uh, audience questioner is, we can perform uh, uh, beamforming. And the, the role of beamforming is really to try to make the microphone array to listen to a given location from SSL, suppressing the signals from the other locations. So um, the problem can be formalized as a weighted sum of the audio signals. So you can see that the X L is all these uh, imp uh, input audio signals from the different channel of the microphone. And then there's a weight matrix, which the weight is related to both where, uh, which channel you're talking about, and also the frequency of the audio signal. And then you can just compose that and get the final output signal. Um, the difficulty here really is how do you get the weighting matrix? And this is another work that's developed by uh, Tashif and uh, 
Rico Marvel in 2005, published in ICASP. And uh, basically what they did is uh, they simplified the problem from a high-dimensional optimization problem to a one-dimensional um, optimization problem. And the final result is they achieve um, 10 to 15 dB noise suppression uh, just by using this uh, beamforming technology. And the last thing is uh, about digital mixing. So now we have two audio sources. One is the audio source coming from the speaker who is wearing a wireless microphone. And then there's also a microphone array. The interface uh, to these devices is actually different at the computer. Uh, the wireless microphone is connected, is captured through a sound card. And the microphone array has a USB input. It's a USB interface. So they are not really synchronized in any way. So it's, it's kind of very, if we just add the two signals together, and then because they are not synchronized, we will hear echoes from, uh, because the microphone array is able actually to capture some of the voice from the speaker. And then the speaker voice just get um, bad. So here's our solution. Uh, uh, this is a route of the wireless speaker microphone um, or the audio, uh, laptop audio out. So we go through the sound capture card. We do noise suppression. Um, we have an automated gain control. And then we send it to the audio output. Now, for the microphone array, um, we first perform a sound source localization. We do beamforming, and then noise suppression and gain control. The problem is we cannot add them directly. So what we add is one more component, a speech detection module here. So we decide that, well, if the speaker is talking about something, then it's, it's going to be more important to what the audience is talking about. So, uh, once we detect their speech going on in the wireless speaker microphone, we will just try to mute the microphone array. And the weight um, W here, we will drop the W to zero. And if the speaker is not talking about the, uh, anything, then he, uh, he or she might be listening to some of the audience. So we raise the W to one so that you can hear the, what's being captured uh, in the microphone um, array. So that's about the audio part. Now, in, the, in terms of slide capturing, here's, here's how we do it. Because we don't require any PowerPoint slide before or after the talk. So what we do is we use a, uh, a video capture card. So um, the uh, video coming out from the laptop, and also maybe there's some uh, document camera. Uh, here is a Wolf Vision uh, system. And both of them can output a VGA signal. And it goes through a distribution amplifier. And one of the signal, uh, and after that, the signal goes to a projector. And at the same time, uh, the signal goes into a Vision RGB Pro uh, video capture card. And then we perform slide detection on that card and then um, send to the uh, slide encoder. Yes. Yes. Um, I don't think we use a file. In, I'm not sure whether it has a firewall interface, but I doesn't. Okay, so maybe so it's just a VGA output. Okay, so now about the video. Uh, that's really um, some of the major things we have improved here because we have a much portable design. So recall that uh, in the iCam two system. Uh, we use a single IP-based Pentium zoom camera at the back trying to capture the speaker. So uh, how do we track the speaker becomes a problem. Um, because in the previous iCam system, we actually use dual cameras. So one camera look at the whole front, frontal area of the lecture room, and so it detects where the speaker is. And then it controls the another camera, pan and tilt, try to focus on where the speaker is. Now, since we do not have a second camera, maybe the speaker just walk out of the field of view, and then we never know where he goes. So we developed this technique called a hybrid speaker tracking. The basic idea is that uh, instead of capturing uh, the speaker at the exact resolution where the output video requires, we actually cap it, capture it with a higher resolution, in this case 640 by 480. And then we crop a subregion. Uh, 320 by 240 and use that as the output. So when the speaker walks around in the field of view, we can actually perform digital uh, panning of this cropped region. And then if the speaker really 
go, almost goes out of the field of view, then we can perform a mechanical panning of the system. So that's uh, what we call a hybrid tracking system. And uh, here the slides I'm showing is uh, a very basic uh, uh, speaker detection algorithm trying to detect where the speaker is in the um, lecture room, in the field of view. So we manually crop out two regions. One we called a detection region, um, and the other called a screen region. Basically, any motion inside the detect region, we think it's the speaker. And because uh, the screen region may overlap with the detection region, so we crop them out because it could be just some slight animation there and we don't want to consider that. And then afterwards, we take the subsequent two frames, frame t and frame t minus one, we subtract them, uh, threshold, and we get a different image. And then we, can, we count vertically within the detection region how many uh, motion pixels are there. And then we just locate the motion region or the speaker region with where all these motion, are, motion pixels are. So this is actually a pretty uh, simple algorithm. But the assumption here is that when the, people is, when the speaker is giving a talk, normally he will either wave the hand, turn his head, and all that. So there's always some motion there, and we can actually detect the speaker very reliably with this very simple algorithm. Uh, now about the digital tracking. Um, so let's say the uh, blue rectangle here is the previous rec cropping region that uh, we use. And then first thing we do is we define a safety region. Um, and then we say that, okay, if the motion region is within the safety region, we just keep the previous cropping region, we don't move. And the reason behind that is uh, a previous study sh uh, shows that from uh, professional videographers, they say, oh, well, they, they suggest us that we should not move our camera too often during the lecture. So, um, so that's why we want this uh, panning thing to be kind of lazy, and we don't want to pan all the time. We just, uh, only when the speaker is, tr is almost gone, then we try to catch up. So that's rule number one. We don't move the uh, cropping region uh, if the motion region is inside. Now there's two, uh, this here's an, another two cases. The first case is the motion region now is completely outside the safety region. So this, is, this shows that the speaker is almost out of the field of view. So if that happens, we want to pan the camera. And the second part is if part of the speaker is outside the safety region, and this has been for a while. So if that's the case, we better readjust our cropping region so that the speaker can be recentered. So here's rule number two. If, all, if the two above cases happen, we want to digitally pan the cropping region according to a constant acceleration limited uh, um, speed model. It's actually a pretty simple model. Basically it says if you, try, if you start to pan, the acceleration of the panning speed is constant. And then there's a top speed you can pan. You don't want to pan like really fast because that makes people dizzy. And there's also studies showing that when, when you just start panning, maybe the acceleration should be bigger. When you stop panning, the acceleration should be smaller. And these are all from uh, studies on the professional videographer's uh, motion. So uh, the rule number three, is that if the motion region now is really near the field of view, uh, the boundary, and then what we should do, of course, is trying to do a mechanical panning because otherwise we will lose the speaker. So this is pretty simple. Uh, rule number four gets a little bit complex. So as I mentioned before, um, the camera at the back of the room not only want, just want to capture the speaker, but it also from time to time want to show the slides. And uh, in this shot, you can see that um, if at this instance I want to switch to a uh, slideshow, I have to pan the camera because the slides are not fully inside the field of view. So uh, what we develop here is that if the speaker region um, is here outside, and in order to uh, bring the uh, screen inside the field of view, we favor a mechanical panning if a panning is needed. So what that really means is that if, say in this case, the person is walking towards the uh, left, 
and we do need a panning there, either digital or mechanical. And of course we can do digital because there's enough space left. But because the, because the screen is not inside, fully inside the field of view, we actually perform a, a prefer a mechanical panning because then we can put the slide fully inside the field of view and any time we can just switch to the slide from the speaker. Uh, this is the last rule about automated uh, zoom level control. Uh, basically the observation is that if the speaker, uh, well speaker have different activities. Some people try to walk around quite often and uh, in that case we don't want to zoom in too much while tracking the speaker. And some people have very low activity and we will just do a relatively high zoom level. Oops. So the uh, zoom level of the speaker camera is uh, adjusted according to the speaker's activity level. Uh, here are some results of our system. These are just static shows, uh, static images. Uh, the top left image is a global view of the lecture room captured from the back speaker camera. And the second one is a screen view, basically focused on what's going on on the screen. And this actually is pretty uh, important and many people like it because uh, although we have the high resolution slide sitting on the right hand side of the web interface, uh, when the people walks into, when the speaker walks into the slide region, we actually want to capture what the people is pointing to so that we get some context information. And so that's, uh, that's about the screen view. And the bottom uh, left is a zoomed out speaker view and the bottom right is a zoom in uh, speaker view. So here's a uh, video live uh, lecture. So first shot you see is a global view and then I switch to, then the system switches to a panning of the whole audience. Um, this shot shows the digital panning and you see the smoothness and also after the panning it switched to a slide view and then when this guy walks back, you still pan back. Um, in this case we're doing a mechanical panning at the very beginning and then followed by a digital panning and then switch to the slide view. So it's a quite complex uh, motion here. Uh, in this case, uh, somebody is asking a question uh, and you can see the, um, the camera point to that person immediately. And in this case, actually, I don't have the audio connected, but uh, when the, the first guy is asking a question, someone in the back asks another question. So the SSL is able actually to locate that guy very quickly and switch to that guy. It's even faster than a human, so that's really uh, nice. Okay, so uh, that's about the, uh, well, there's one more about the uh, scripting language. So we have all these um, cinematography rules that we actually learn from professional uh, videographers and we need a way to specify it in the system. In the previous iCamp system we just uh, hard code everything to the code so it becomes very uh, difficult to change uh, if we move the system to another room because say the frontal area is completely different and uh, how much pen is different so uh, that, that's very difficult. So, what we developed in ICAM2 is a scripting language. Uh, basically, it's a text file, and the, the system just loads the text file at the very beginning, and then it learns uh, all these um, uh, rules. So here's just a simple example, like uh, uh, the first few lines, just some definition of names. From line uh, 09, these are the transactions. So, for example, um, line number 10 says, okay, if the audience camera has low confidence, let's switch to the uh, speaker camera. So the thing goes like this, uh, line number 11, the current status being the audience camera, and if three conditions are satisfied, we are going to do some switch. And the number 12 line is all the three conditions. The confidence of the speaker camera is greater than two. That means the the speaker camera has locked on the speaker and started tracking the speaker. And the second one is the confidence of the audience camera is lower than five. That means um, there's no um, SSL in, in, uh, responders saying there's nobody asking a question in the audience. 
And then also the last condition is time is greater than five, meaning we have been staying at the audience view for more than five seconds. And we'd better do a switch. Uh, line number 13 says we are going to switch the speaker at a probability of 1.0. Uh, the line number 27 is another example. Uh, if the speaker camera has been up for more than 90 minutes, let's randomly choose one view to show. So condition is we are at the, uh, well, we are now at the speaker view. Only one condition need to be met. Time has been more than 90 seconds. And then we switch to the speaker with chance of 1.0 and audience with chance of 2.0. So that kind of gives some randomness to the system, making it more pleasing instead of a me mechanical feeling of what's going on. Okay, so now let me uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, usage statistics we have. Um, the ICANN system, the first generation, was launched um, uh, June 2001. And ICAM 2 was launched October uh, last year. Until mid-August this year, there have been altogether 522 lectures recorded, and there are more than 20,000 live on-demand on sessions, uh, among which 11,000 uh, are live sessions, uh, 54 percent. And then there's more than 9,000 is uh, on-demand sessions. So um, actually, this is quite interesting because um, in the previous work uh, from UC Berkeley, they actually uh, their system is developed for a students. So basically, they record a lecture for the students to prepare their exam before, uh, so they can go back to review the lecture when they are going to do exam. So in their case, they actually observe there's more than 85% of the sessions are on-demand sessions. Now, here in a corporate environment, we, we have much, many, many more live sessions here. And I guess the reason is that um, in, in our environment, um, kind of people like to stay in their office, but at the same time, he may be doing some multitask, multi replying some email or what, but then he also wants to be synchronized what's, with what's going on in the lecture room. So uh, the, the number of live sessions is uh, many, many more. And uh, here is uh, the statistic of the lecture and viewing statistics. So the, uh, the horizontal line is the uh, quarters of uh, time, and the vertical line is the number. So the blue curve, blue solid curve, shows the number of lectures being recorded uh, across time. And uh, the, um, purple, the purple dot curve um, actually shows the number of live sessions, and the, uh, the other curve shows the number of on-demand sessions. And the numbers are about 20 to 30. So every lecture, there's about 20 to 30 uh, people watching the lecture online. Uh, the number is not very big, but considering that all the lectures given at MSR are very technical talk. So um, it's actually pretty significant. And also, if you look at the number of people now going to the actual lecture room to listen to the talk, it's normally less than 20. So we actually have more online people watch, watching the lecture than people who are actually sitting in the lecture room. Um, this is the distribution of lectures. Um, basically, the horizontal line is the number of sessions, and the vertical line is the number of lectures. So you can see that for most of the um, lectures, we actually have about uh, less than uh, 40 uh, sessions going on. Uh, of course, there's a few that has more than 100 sessions, which is pretty good talk, I guess. Um, and also, we have statistics on when do on-demand sessions happen after the lecture. So you can see that uh, the horizontal line is the time after the talk. Vertical line is the average number of on-demand sessions per day. And you can see the first day, there's a huge number of uh, um, on-demand sessions, and then it goes a uh, exponential decay. Uh, it drops really fast, and after half a year or one year, basically there's nobody goes back to that lecture anymore. Um, this is another um, interesting statistic, basically showing when do people like to watch the lecture. Uh, the horizontal line is the time of the day, and the vertical line is the number of on-demand sessions. And you can see many people here likes to watch uh, lectures uh, in the afternoon. 
We don't have a very particular reason for this, but I guess after the lunch, people get tired, and they maybe they just go online to watch some lecture. Um, OK, so conclusions. Um, as far as we know, ICAM and ICAM2 um, is the only existing system that automates both content capturing and broadcasting. Uh, we have a very well-designed system architecture that enables uh, audio, video, slide synchronization, and we have minimum pre- and post-production. Um, ICAM2 has many enhancements over ICAM uh, first generation in, in terms of its audio, video quality and how it get implemented. Uh, here are some future work we have. Um, actually, this summer we did a project for distributed ICAM. Um, the, this is for distributed classroom. So imagine that uh, multiple universities trying to run a class. And then maybe the speaker is just on one side, and there's some um, different side that have all these audience there. And how do we uh, uh, do this lecture recording uh, using a distributed system? And the second thing is uh, we want to improve the current sound source localization. And the current sound source localization is good, but it only tells a horizontal angle. It does not tell a 2D angle. So we want to improve that uh, with a 2D SSL for better audience speaker localization. And uh, also we are thinking of adding more indexing features. Uh, basically, you have all these talks now stored on the database server. How do you index them so that people can search the lectures more easily? Um, okay, that's the end of the talk. Any questions? Thanks. Yes. Um, which, what, what part is funny? <laughs> Yes, that's possible. That's totally possible. Um, yes, that's possible. Well, we do have some rules. For example, we, uh, we don't switch to that person unless the SSL has been reliably detecting that uh, voice for a while. So if you cough, then maybe it won't activate that switch. And uh, uh, also, um, Actually, we got uh, some feedback from the uh, client, people inside the corporate, saying that a system is actually good if you from time to time switch to the audience. Say, somebody come in, uh, clamp the door, and our audience camera just point to that direction. And that's good because you get more feeling of really being local instead of viewing it on, uh, remotely. So that's good part and bad part about it. Yes. Um, you mean some kind of a study of how good the quality of the system is. Yeah, we actually did a uh, field study uh, with the first generation uh, ICAM system. And the quality is actually comparable to what being shot by a professional uh, videographer. Uh, we haven't got time to uh, do this study for the second generation system. But just based on our own subjective uh, measure, we think the quality is roughly equal. But we save a lot of hardware and things like that. Okay, yeah. I could add my uh, N of 1, but I think it's a very good system. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, don't you think your algorithm uh, like, uh, has a lot of theoretical assumptions? Like, uh, how about <coughs> goes to the front of the uh, uh, screen? <coughs> and you notice it as the images change, and maybe your, uh, your, your image algorithm can say, like, you mean the, 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 the speaker detection part, or you mean the... Uh, yes, so the slide detection change, I didn't talk much about it. It's actually, we're using a very simple slide detection algorithm. Uh, we borrow some idea from uh, uh, algorithm in background modeling, basically assuming that uh, if it doesn't change, it's a background. And then if it changes, then it shows some foreground. It's a very simple algorithm. And... Uh, uh, there's one thing that I want to say is that for this slide, particular slide detection algorithm used in our system, we don't need it to be super accurate. We can re really tune the system to probably detect more slides than it actually is. 
but from the remote client peer experience point of view, he doesn't really know because uh, everything is hidden. He just show all the images, see all the images. So um, we don't, yeah, we didn't go really like a, find a complex slide detection algorithm trying to, to. More questions? How do you address uh, consent of the audience? Uh, you mean the local audience or the... The, um, the audience, you know, that, that's being recorded? Uh, well, so, well, one thing we did is we put a post on the door of the lecture room saying anything in this room will be likely to be recorded. And I guess people have some, already have some privilege. We so far haven't received any, like, objection or... Uh, we are being recorded also, yeah, so, um, I guess. Yeah. And the, the system is actually pretty um, uh, unintrusive in the sense that people actually don't realize there's a, a system when they're listening to a talk because, um, yeah. That's, that's better or worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes? Um, the script, I don't know much about it, detail about that, but I believe the script contains when the slide is captured, the time stamp, and also where, what is the image, what is, where the image is stored. So, yeah, so the, you can just retrieve that image. Yes. What about uh, screen capture of arbitrary applications? Does that, does that mess up your? Uh, what kind of application? So if my if my lecture starts a web browser, oh, starts to run. That's not a problem because we actually capture the, we actually take the signal out, because the signal coming to the video capture card is exactly the same coming out from the projector. So. That's exactly the same. We do have problem with a certain type of laptops like Vio because I guess somehow our video capture card doesn't work with, they have kind of okay, particular. Okay, so that goes to the RGB Pro as well and gets uh, frame from that. Yeah, we and do. And then you're sending a sequence of scripts with those images? Yes. At what so, frequency? Um, the slide detection is currently done a uh, about one frame per second, so yeah, um, yeah. Actually, I probably can mention that one of the future work may add some more remote desktop uh, possibilities, so you can actually c capture continuous motion of the, what's being shown on the screen. But yeah, it's future work. Okay, thank you. <laughs>